mic on, then again, maybe it doesn't. Uh, good, morning. good morning. I trust all of you had a nice Sabbath. Amen. See, you don't know how to answer that, do you? I trust all of you had a nice Sabbath. Yes. You still don't get it. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. right. Thank you. My daughter's the only one that got it. Okay. Um, before I begin... Someone brought to my attention that uh, Pastor Phil, uh, why are you wearing white socks? We noticed them last week. I have developed another new problem. I am now allergic to socks. And my legs break out into these terrible itching sores is the best way I can describe it. So they, I'm doing the white socks, but I'm allergic to the nylon that's in the elastic. So now I'm, they're ordering me some new socks. Now are you ready for this? And if that doesn't work, I get to go barefoot. <laughs> which really ought to be interesting. So anyway, that is why you see me wearing white socks. I know it doesn't go with a suit or shirt or dress, but you do what you got to do. Amen? Everybody's still full from Thursday? I am. My wife makes something called cranberry salad that you can keep everything else. I can make a meal off the cranberry salad. It's whole cranberries, pineapple chunks, walnuts, cherry, and um, cranberry type jello. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you. That or fruit salad, as you all know, whenever I see fruit salad, just get out of the way. Y'all can have everything else. I'm happy. I love fruit salad. I love anything that's got fruit in it. People say pumpkin pie. Uh, I do not like pumpkin pie. Sweet potato pie. Uh, I'm not a sweet potato pie person. Now, say cherry pie. Say peach cobbler. Say apple pie. Say anything that's got fruit in it. I'm the first in line if it's got fruit. By the way, we're looking for a new elder <laughs> because we just lost one. One of our future deaconesses here making an offering. <laughs> anyway, this morning what I'd like to speak to you about is God's will versus my will. And some of you may appreciate this and some of you may not. But we shall see where the Lord takes us this morning. If you would, please bow your heads with me. Our most kind and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, again, for the opportunity to be here before your saints, and I ask your blessing upon all of us, that you would pour your spirit out on all of us, that we may truly understand the hour and the day in which we live in the nearness of your coming. For centuries, Lord, we've been looking and we've been waiting but now more than ever the signs are there that you're even at the door. So we ask your blessing 
in all that we say that we do and strengthen me this one more time to speak in accordance with your will. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God's will versus my will. A magazine decided they'd like to do something humorous. So they went to 100 homes. The husband and wife were standing beside each other and they asked this very simple question of all 100 homes. Who is in charge or the boss of the home? 90 homes, the woman immediately responded and said, I am. And the husband agreed. Nine of the homes, the man said, well, I am, and the wife disagreed. One home out of the hundred, the wife said, well, my husband is the boss of the home. And they said, congratulations, your husband has won a prize. We'll give him a choice of two items. Whereas the man turned to his wife and said, honey, which one do I take? <laughs> Today, we're talking about our will and God's will. It's called submission. But first of all, we need to know its meaning. Now, I'm putting it up on the screen so you can follow along and hopefully it'll burn it into your minds because I believe within the church there is a complete misunderstanding of submission and what it truly means. Submission is a term that has often been misused within the church. It is a word that has been utilized to let women know just who the boss is in society, in church, in the home, and in marriage. In order to understand what submission really means, we need to find the original definition of the word. And next, we need to understand it in its context and culture. What does submission or submit really mean in the Bible? Now, in the Greek, the word that we translate submit has two meanings. Now, this is right out of the Bible, right out of the Greek. One is a military sense and means to arrange troops in a soldierly fashion under the command of a leader. It is mandatory obedience to a higher authority. The second meaning is a non-military, everyday sense, and means a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, and assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. Sound familiar? Now first, it's necessary. Submission is at the core of man's relationship with God. It's at the very core of man's relationship with God. James 4, 7 to 8 speaks to us so plainly with these words. Therefore, do what? Submit to God. Now, did it say man and woman? It just says those of us who are following Jesus Christ are submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, understand that in submission in the Bible... Unfortunately, many of us in all denominations take the first meaning in the Greek that our wives are to be completely submissive to us and women are to be subordinate to us. And the Bible never intended that. If you remember in Matthew chapter 22, there was a story told. Jesus told the story of the woman who married all seven brothers. And then the question was asked, of whose wife will she be in heaven? And Jesus said, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures, for it shall be as it was in the beginning. She, they will neither give, be given in marriage nor give in marriage. Do you understand? It was never meant to be this way. We've made it this way, that our marriages, 
that our relationships when it comes to a man and a woman are of a military nature. She must completely submit to the man's will. But it has never been God's way. We, under the banner of the cross, have said, even in our marriage ceremonies, do you, will you submit to your husband? Why doesn't the man have to admit he's going to submit to his wife? We talk about equality in the church, but we don't really mean it as long as it doesn't infringe on my rights to lord over you. And it was never so from the beginning. Do you even realize that the way that we have marriage now is from the fall? It was never originally to be that way and you shall be submissive to your husband. It was never to be that way. Total equality is what God wanted for Adam and Eve. It was submission. Even in the garden, it was to be submission of Adam's will to God. But because he didn't trust God, he didn't submit himself to God's will. And therefore, we to this day, thousands of years later, still are involved in the curse and waiting for the Lord's return. Submission, what it truly means. Philippians 2, 6-8, instead he made himself nothing. Who made himself nothing? Jesus Christ, but he was a man. How can a man be made nothing? He did this by taking on the nature of a servant. He was made just like human beings. He appeared as a man. He was humble and obeyed God completely or submitted to his Father's will. If I am a man, I am to submit to the will of God. If you're a woman, you are to submit to the will of God. When we start lording over our ladies, when we start lording over women because we're men, just because we happen to be born men. Well, that's the luck of the draw. You were born a woman. Too bad. Is that really what God intended? Is that really the way God looks at it? That, well, you're a woman. Learn to live with it. It's something to think about because it never was intended to be this way. Look at this. Biblical submission is universal. By that I mean that it's meant for everybody or for all. This is not a command based on gender alone. It is not just about wives, women, children being in submission. It is also about husbands, men, and boys. It is expected of all in submission. There is no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free person, no male or female, because we are all one in who? Christ. Jesus Christ. We're the ones that build the walls, that keep God from do giving us the blessings as a church, as a people, as a nation, when we build walls up and separate one another. It's not supposed to be that way. It's our hang-ups. God doesn't have a hang-up with women. He doesn't have a hang-up with men. Is God macho? Or is he God? One of the things I've been trying to stress with you is God's thoughts are not our thoughts. He doesn't think like we do. And it always bothers me when somebody goes, well, I get your point, and then the magic three-lettered word, but I see where you're coming from, but, but simply means I'm not buying it. I've made my mind up. You ride your horse and I'll ride mine. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible teaches. This is what I want to believe. This is what I'm comfortable in. So we wrap it around ourselves and we say, well, I'm comfortable here, so I'm going to stay here. God is not a God of many, many different beliefs in how you feel about it. What you think is right. That's another one that I love. Well, you made a good point, Pastor. But I think, but I think, see there's the but and then we add the I think. God says, no, you're not getting it. 
My thoughts aren't yours. You see, you're going to look at something I've set down and gone, that doesn't make sense, it's not fair. It's too easy. Why does the Bible say let your answer be yes or let your answer be no? Kind of gets rid of the wishy-washiness, doesn't it? Did you like the movie? Well, it was, uh, it, 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 was, it was nice. Did you like it or not? Have you ever noticed in a court of law, anybody here ever been in a court of law? I have. Isn't it interesting when that attorney walks up to you and goes, now, where were you on such and such a date? And you give the date. And then he asks you something else. Now, just answer yes or no. Did you hit Mr. Smith? Well, no, well, yes, I did, but you don't, just answer yes or no. Yes, I hit him. Then when your defense attorney gets up, he brings out the points. One of the first things I learned is you never volunteer information. Just answer the question. Is your name Phil Hammond? Yes. Did you go to school? Yes. He didn't ask where I graduated where I was in my class, what I took. If he asked me, I'll tell him. I was once subpoenaed to go to court. It's been years ago. And while I was there, I couldn't understand why I was being subpoenaed. You want to know why? Because it was about marriage. I didn't even know it. And I got called into the courtroom, and here was the judge sitting. Here was the, what's that guy called, the stenographer? Is that what it is? Yeah, stenographer. And they take down every, you know, you clear your throat. It's in there. I don't know how they do it. They're sitting there. Looks like he's bored to me, but he's getting everything down. And I'm being cross-examined. I don't even know why I'm there as a witness. And then I realized what it was all about. I wasn't on trial. The church was. Yes, the church was. Because you see, the attorney got up and said, well, does your church teach this? And I said, no. I gave one word answers. No. Because you see, the gentleman that it came to me actually said this. I want you to get my ex to take me back. I want you to use the church, his words, and make her marry me again because she's got to submit to me. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So then the attorney got up and said, did so-and-so ask you for help? Yes. Did you give it to him? You know what my answer was? No. And I can remember the judge looking over because after all, that's a pastor sitting there and he just said someone asking for help and he said no. But then the other guy got up and said, now you said you didn't help. Why? Then I got to explain why. You see, God's thoughts aren't ours. We're the ones that put all the buts and the I think. The Ten Commandments are pretty simple, aren't they? If you really think about it, there's ten of them. But yet they cover a whole gamut of things. But it's too simple. It's just too simple. You've got land boundaries. Whose is whose? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. Want more? It's simple. But yet you walk into an attorney's office and he specializes in one area and he'll have volume after volume of all these different stipulations and stuff, but it all gets down to the same thing. Don't hit your neighbor or he will sue you. All these things get added. We added them. In heaven, there aren't volumes of laws. There's God's law, period. End of story. God knows best. The angels trust him. Those that didn't left they were cast out. We're the ones that challenge God. We're the ones that say, what if? Look at this. As followers of Jesus, we are first subject to God. James 4, 7, and 8. Then we are mutually subject to each other. Ephesians 5, 21. Husbands and wives are to be equally in submission to each other. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. And finally, we are also all to be subject to all. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Write them down. Read it for yourself. It's what the Bible says. Because to be perfectly honest with you, you don't 
care what my opinion is. And you shouldn't. But you should care what is God's. What does God expect of me? What does God expect of you? Instead of going and reading a book and we get all these volumes of books, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I'm just, you know, we, we, we will go get a book that tells us what the Bible says. Have you read the book on this? It explains the Bible. Why not just read the Bible and ask God to guide you through the power of the Holy Spirit that you'll better understand it? Will you learn it all in one sitting? No, nobody has. We're still looking at it thousands of years later and still finding more truth because that's the, it's the mind of God. And every time you think you got it, then you go, oh, I never saw that before. And it was there. That's how God operates. He has a thought that seems so simplistic and you can't go any further with it and yet the theologian, there's 42 aliens in my backyard and they print it as the truth. Nobody came and looked. But when I went to school in the old days, we had horses. But anyway, and chariots too. And when I went to school, I can still remember the five things you had to do before you could print a story in journalism. Who, what, when, where, and why. All these years later, 50 years later, who, what, when, where, and why. Not anymore. I don't even care who said it. I think you said it, so I'm going to write it anyway. And if it's not true, you'll let me know. Somebody will. Somebody will catch it. Somebody will catch the error as a million go running off the cliff. That's journalism today. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer, and I'm not trying to get political. How many of you all believe what you hear on the news service today? All you got to do is raise your hand. What does that tell you? I don't care if you're an ultra-conservative or an ultra-liberal. I don't believe it. We're fed what everybody wants us to know. God says, but I've got a book that I want you to know. You want to know where you came from? You want to know where you're going? You want to know what's in between? You want to know how to live your life? You want to know about people who have struggled? People who won and who lost, who were saved and who were lost? what they went through. You want to read about somebody who was lost but then became saved because they turned their life around? One of them's name was Saul who became Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. But if he was persecuting the church. He was putting people in jail. He was breaking up families. But yet God looked at him and said, that's my man. Why? Because God's thoughts are not ours. He saw the heart. He just needed to have an attitude adjustment. And boy, did he get one. And when he did, there was no stopping Paul. You could threaten him. You could starve him. You could literally beat him to death. And he would dust himself off and be at the gate the next day, knocking on it, preaching Jesus. We need some Pauls. And there's young people out there. They're here. They just don't know their Paul yet. They're Paulettes. They just don't know it yet. And it's not just you men. It's you young ladies too. Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote this. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. The simple fact is that submission is absolutely essential for us all. The absolute truth is either Jesus is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. It's that simple. He's either the creator, he's either the son of God, he's either God or he isn't. End of story. He either is the creator of everything everything, every atom, or he's not. It's just that simple. 
I don't need to go see a movie. I don't need to go read a book from the ABC. I don't care if it's our own books. I need to read that one that's the B-I-B-L-E. And if I study that hard enough and long enough, all these other things will be added unto you. I'll know the character of God. I'll know what being made in His image is truly like. I'll know what God is like because I'll study His Son. Because He told me plainly from the Word of God, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In the story, no, yes, but no. If you've seen me, you've met the Father in heaven. For my Father and I are one in the same. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Second thing we need to know about submission is it is voluntary. In the Old Testament, Joshua set the standard of voluntary submission with the following words found in Joshua 24, 15. I bet everyone knows it. Then choose your, for yourselves right now whom you will serve. You can choose the gods your people served east of the Euphrates River or you can serve the gods of the Amorites. After all, you are living in their land. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. He made a decision. A conscious decision. No buts. He simply said, look, here we are. You've got a choice to make. God gives you that power to make that free will choice. But as for me and my family, we choose God. And it don't matter where I live. I can be on the wrong side of the tracks. In the wrong neighborhood. I can be in the hood. I can be in Chicago. I can be anywhere. And I can serve God. I can be in Uganda. And there can be slavery all around me. There can be horrible things going on. But I can still serve God. Because God doesn't say it depends on your atmosphere. Or what the civilized world has done to you. It's not your fault. You still have freedom to choose. And I choose to serve God. New Testament commentator William Barclay writes about submission with these words. It is not a spineless submission that is meant, but rather it is a voluntary selflessness. It is a submission based on the death of pride and the desire to serve. It is the submission not of fear, but of perfect love. Boy, I see it all the time in my wife. You all are used to me always making jokes about her, but that's what keeps us married for 45 years, is we still kid each other and laugh at each other. I'm the biggest fool she's ever met in her life. Did I just say that? And where's your membership, sir? Okay. I think I forgot your name, too. <laughs> but I, I'm always amazed, as bad as her back is, she'll say, would you like something to drink? And she'll get up and go get it. She doesn't get around that well, but I see that submissive, I'll do it for you. I'll see her fix a meal and ask what everybody wants and see that they're fed first and then worry about it, that everybody gets something warm and hot before she will eat. I see it all the time. Day in, day out. Not a one-time thing, but an all-the-time thing. That's a submission of love, a giving of self that she chooses to do. She doesn't have to. She chooses to submit to her family and put others above herself. That's being a Christian. That's what Jesus is talking about. 
You know, in the desire of ages, one of the things that we don't know that much about Jesus when he was a boy. But one of the things we know is a lot of times he would take his own food, as meager as it was, and go and give it to those that had nothing. No one asked him to. His mother didn't say, this is something you need to do. She didn't say, if you don't eat that, there are children starving in Uganda. Because I'd always wonder when my dad would tell me that there's kids that would die to have that food you're not eating. And I'd think, if I eat it, will they be less hungry? No, they won't. But he would take what he had and he would share it. And I, I, that's why, if you all have ever noticed, when I do get over to the fellowship hall, I always eat last. I got that from my mother. She said, you always let your guests go first. So even at home, JJ, when we have Thanksgiving dinner, did you notice? I will not get out of my chair that everyone eats, has something on their plate, then I go. And it doesn't look like I'm starving to death, does it? Because that's not what's important. People are what's important. When we have our fellowship dinner, it's not the food. It's the fellowship. Dinner's at the end. It's the sitting there and going, how's it going with you? How you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? You look great. Let me get my hands on that baby. Oh, she's got such big blue eyes, big brown eyes, whatever. He, she, oh, I'm expecting, did you know? No, when? <coughs> it's the fellowship. And next Sabbath is our fellowship dinner, and you need to bring extra because it's Christmas time. And no, by you eating more, it won't get anybody else any more food out there, but we're working on some things on that through the Hope Food Program. But this is a time so you'll stay longer. So bring enough for you and your families and guests that may be here. Because it's fellowship. It's being submissive to total strangers. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3.18 None of our faces are covered with a veil. All of us can see the Lord's glory and think deeply about it. So we are being changed to become more like him so that we have more and more glory. And this glory comes from the Lord who is the Holy Spirit. That's from the NIRV, as you can see up there. I use different versions. Whoever says it the best. But our glory comes from God, and he does. It, there's no greater feeling than to help someone else and expect nothing in return. You see, that's always bothered me about Christianity. If somebody will say something to me like, Pastor, you know, I did this or that, and they didn't even say thank you. Were there not ten who were healed? Jesus healed ten lepers of a horrible disease. Only one said thank you. Jesus didn't say, huh, well, they don't know who they're dealing with. <laughs> now they've got their leprosy back because they didn't say thank you. I, when my dad was living, BJ and I were talking about this. One of the things my dad loved to do for Thanksgiving was to go down and serve food. He just loved it. And then they would come home and they'd have their Thanksgiving dinner. But dad would get in line and he would sit there and he would watch the people go through and he would put the cranberry sauce or turkey or whatever it was on their plates as they would go by. And he would just glow when he would come home. He just felt, dad just loved that kind of stuff. And I remember at his funeral service, those of you know me, you've heard me say it a hundred times, but I'm bragging. And... It was the largest funeral service besides my wife's father, who was the same way, that I'd ever preached then or since. I mean, I'd never seen that many people. My mother didn't even know who a lot of the people were. They just came, total strangers from Ohio. And this was in Winchester, Virginia. How they even knew my dad died, I don't know. And they came down and they would tell these stories. 
Your father, he, he put a transmission and he ran a transmission shop. He owned it. He put a tra- and sent me on my way. I didn't have any money. I was dead broke. And to- said, pay me when you get it. What kind of a businessman is that? But yet dad always had more work than he could handle. Never advertised. Didn't have to. But he loved it. He loved that feeling. I remember coming home out to see mom and dad, and here comes this man out of the kitchen, total stranger, and this woman and three kids. And, you know, dad's making small talk. He's ignoring them. They're coming out and sitting down watching TV, and I'm kind of like, you know, who are these people? And then finally, oh, dad goes, oh, this is so-and-so. They broke down here, and I, I'm letting them stay here for the weekend until I can get there. I'm going to bring the boys in tomorrow because it was Sabbath. I'm going to bring them in on Sunday and we're going to get their transmission fixed and get them on their way. No charge. Just, just needed some help because the local sheriff's department would call my dad when he would, they would run across things like that. Family stranded, stuff like that. Dad saw that they got on their way. So you know what? The sheriff's department said, we want you to do all our cars from now on. The city police department said, we want you to do all of our vehicles from now on. And the state police, we want you to do all of our vehicles from now on. Simply because these men and women who were out there on the front lines knew that Fred Hammond was the guy you sent people to. That he wouldn't question and say, are you Hispanic? Are you a Christian, a non-Christian? Are you a Jew? Are you a Muslim? He could care less. Do you need help? And then he would send them on their way and he would always pull the man aside. And I, I always knew. Dad put his arm up on their shoulder. Have you got any money? Well, yeah, I'll be all right, Fred. I'll be all right. Have you got money for gas? What are you going to feed those kids on the road? So he'd give them, peel them off cash. Give it back to me when you get a chance or pass it on to someone else. That's being submissive. What would Jesus do? Why is it only at Christmas time we realize people are hungry? Why is it at Christmas time we only realize people don't have fuel oil and are cold or sleeping under a bridge? Why is the want so much more at that time of year? Because we think of all those wonderful stories. We think of all the things that we've heard. We think about Jesus. We think about the manger. It keeps being put before us, so then we start feeling guilty. So then we start going by the kettles and dropping money in because it makes us feel better. I got news for you. God don't need your money. What he needs is you. And all you have to do, I told you this before, and it is true and it works. In the morning, you pray, Lord God, if there's someone you want me to witness to today in word or deed place them in my path and then in Jesus name amen forget about it and then you will start having things happen in your life and then something strange will happen in this church because when I was growing up in Sabbath school there used to be a time called testimony time and people would stand up and say this week I was at the grocery store and This person needed help, and they would tell of the people they helped or a tract they gave it to. We don't hear those stories anymore. You want to know why? Because we come to church and we go home, and we leave God right here. Because we don't have time. We've got all this stuff that saves us all this time, but we have no time. We got cell phones and I-7s and 6s and 5s and iPads and air pads and instant everything and clouds and this cloud and that cloud and Amazon and Amazon TV and Apple TV and all this stuff that just puts it at your fingertips. But we don't have any time. So where is this amazing piece of mechanical whatever that's going to give us all this time that we can finally get out there and do something. I wonder what our early pioneers would have said. You're doing what? Facebooking. Yeah, but look how many people I'm reaching. True. 
you're reaching a lot, but they'd rather see you. They'd rather touch you, not just put their hand on the screen and feel the static. You see, it's about people. It's being submissive and to submit to one another. The third thing is it's for all of us, not just the ladies and the children. It is gender inclusive, not gender exclusive. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for who? Christ. We all are commanded to submit to or to be in submission to God as James writes in 4.7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Both Paul and James make no distinction as to who should and who should not be in submission. It doesn't say, you ladies, you children. It says, followers of Jesus Christ. Same God. Submission is not a one-way street. We tend to misquote Ephesians 5.22. Here we go. By only using the first five words, wives submit to your husbands. We forget the next four words which say, as to the Lord. That doesn't mean he lords over you. We would rather ignore what Paul says a couple of verses on down. Verse 25. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving and That's from the message Bible. There is a misconception within the church that submission is a right. By that I mean some strongly believe that a husband has the right to demand his wife's submission. A husband does not have the right to demand or extract submission from his wife. Submission is a choice. It is not a husband's divine right. Not ever. Amen. That's not a part of her makeup because we're guys. I should submit to my wife as my wife submits to me. That's equality. Now, is it ever going to be a perfect equality? Not till the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Then it's going to be a perfect equality. Not under the bed, Mike. I'll never forget that time you told me that. That, that is funny. I love that. <laughs> Private joke. Uh, anyway, but it's, it's, it's equality. It's what God really intended. We're the ones that have perverted it. Satan has perverted it and put in this mind that, well, it says, wives, submit to your husband. So in other words, crawl, baby. Thank God every day you've got me. Oh, lucky girl. Not really. That's equality. When submission to one authority conflicts with submission to another, we are obligated to submit to the highest authority. The highest authority is always God. And so when family, political, or religious authorities seek to compel us to co be contrary or act contrary to the word of God, we, like Peter in Acts 5.29, will say we must obey God instead of people or instead of man. It doesn't matter if it's within the church, folks. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Amen? Amen. Right. The church has always made mistakes. All churches have always made mistakes. Some to the tune of 50 to maybe 500 million, you know, make mistakes because we're human beings. We're not God. And churches make mistakes and make wrong decisions because they're not allowing themselves to be led by God. They're trying to lead God. There was a man who went to an art museum. And on the wall was a beautiful painting of Jesus on the cross. And as he was staring at this painting, 
the night watchman came over and said, you're looking at it wrong. He said, you need to move lower. So the man kind of leaned forward, looked up, and he noticed he saw things he didn't see before. And the guard tapped him on the shoulder and said, no, lower. So the man went down on one knee, and he looked up, and sure enough, he saw even more of the beauty of the painting, the agony of Jesus on the cross. And the guard tapped him on the shoulder one more time and said, no, lower. And so the man kind of shook his head and got down on both knees, and then he looked up, and he saw the picture in its true light for the first time because now he was where he needed to be, kneeling before and at the foot of Jesus Christ. Amen. To truly be able to see our God, we need to submit to him completely at the foot of the cross. My friends, Sister White wrote in Acts of the Apostles, page 209, Kneeling in faith at the cross, the sinner has reached the highest place to which one can attain, and that's to kneel at the foot of Jesus. That's when you're at your highest, is when we submit to the will of God. Amen? Amen. My friends, may God richly bless you. May God richly bless you men. Ladies, may God richly bless you. And may we all, men, women, and children, learn to completely submit ourselves to Jesus and to his will. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for being our God. I thank you, Lord, that you showed us what we need to do that you were even unto death submissive to the will of your Father in heaven to completely give all, to not think of self but of others. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you're about to do. And we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is going to be For the Beauty of the Earth, page 565, and we're going to be doing all three verses, and please stand. name.